Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this webinar on Getting a Clue, Pearls and Pitfalls, presented by Dr. Bruce Kamura. The AIUM is pleased to present this event in collaboration with the American College of Physicians and the Society of Ultrasound in Medical Education. The AIUM is accredited by the ACCME. This webinar is designated for one AMA PRA Category 1 credit. By the conclusion of this webinar, participants should be able to explain the concepts and discuss the pearls and common pitfalls to cardiac limited ultrasound examination in point of care diagnostic evaluation. As an ACCME accredited provider, it is the AIUM's policy to ensure that the contents and quality of this activity are balanced, independent, objective, and scientifically rigorous. All individuals who are in a position to control the content of an educational activity are required to complete a disclosure form. All disclosures are reviewed by the AIUM, and any conflicts of interest are resolved or managed prior to an activity. Dr. Kamura and Kathy Minton have no disclosures. At the conclusion of the webinar, you will be able to access the CME test and evaluation located on the AIUM website. Participants who complete the post-test with a grade of 70% or higher will be awarded one CME credit. Credits for this webinar are approved for physicians, sonographers, and radiologic technologists. During tonight's presentation, if you have questions for the presenter, you may type them into the question box on the right side of your screen. You will be able to submit questions throughout this webinar, but the presenter will not begin answering until the end of the presentation, at which time he will answer as many questions as possible. A recording of this webinar will be available on the AIUM website. And now, we're pleased to present Dr. Bruce Kamura. Hey everybody, my name is Bruce Kimura, and I'm a cardiologist in San Diego and director of the Echovascular Ultrasound Lab at Scripps Mercy Hospital. Over the past 20 years or so, my team and I have developed the Cardiac Limited Ultrasound Examination, or CLU, from a perspective of, de of developing an efficient, modernized ultrasound physical. We've validated and integrated the CLUE concept here as a clinical and teaching tool into the internal medicine residency for over a decade now and have incorporated the CLUE exam into every echo performed at Mercy for over seven years. So what may well be over 20,000 CLUE applications, I'd like to share with you what we've learned, how we've changed, and what pitfalls we've fallen into. And I hope this information is useful to all levels of users, but let's start easy. So what exactly is CLU, um, besides being a very good acronym? Well, CLU, Cardiovascular Limited Ultrasound Examination, was defined as a bedside application for the clinician, basically in the field, is what I like to say. I've included a summary article recently published in the Journal of Ultrasound and Medicine, and it is a good summary of uh, the rationale behind CLU. So CLU had to be short, efficient, and easily applied during a routine physical examination. Remember, as a physical exam, one quickly looks for signs of disease as being simply present or absent. Each clue sign has been validated to be incrementally accurate when added to the physical, clinically prevalent, and have outcome or prognostic evidence. Unlike specific limited echo protocols, CLU is to be performed routinely on all patients, just like the stethoscope, and one use, uses the data you get from CLU as a part of the physical examination. In point-of-care ultrasound, CLU is therefore formative in the synthesis of a differential, rather than being a separate test performed after physical examination to rule in or rule out a disease. So 
For that reason, there is some laxity here. The imaging protocol doesn't have to be 100% accurate or 100% definitive, but just demonstrate incre incremental value compared with standard examination. It provides another clue in physical diagnosis, and that's why it's appropriately named. We've learned that in order to be used by the busy clinician, the clue would use one transducer on a pocket carry device and require minimal time. We like to try to complete clue within a minute, but importantly, clue must have the capability to be expanded for more advanced or subspecialty users. The objectives of this talk are to one, describe clue theory, two, describe the pearls and pitfalls in acquisition and interpretation that we found over the years, and three, um, demonstrate clue in a recent case at our hospital. On the right, I've included here a diagram of clue. One starts at the peristernal lung axis, examines the anteroapex apex of the lung, and the posterior bases, and then finally the subcostal view. The clue includes seven signs obtained from six sites performed in a specific order to help learning and diagnosis. This, these signs uh, we'll go over and can be abbreviated by the first letter in each of their names which form the mnemonic CLUES, C-L-U-E-S. These signs are either present or absence and must be reconciled with other findings um, to come up with differential diagnoses. So this is what makes CLUE so different from other point of care ultrasound exams. The CLUE is set up as a general assessment of the heart and lungs. Residents learn the exam by working backward against the flow of blood. They start with the peristernal lung axis and they look to assess LV function and then ask does the left atrium feel the left ventricular pressures, then do the lungs feel the left atrial pressures, then does the RV feel the lung abnormality, and finally does the IVC feel the right heart pressures. Ideally, the advanced users can develop more granularity to this method, for instance, by adding the ascending aorta or the aortic valve for aortic stenosis, or even the mitral valve. But regardless of level, by working backwards, one can structure his or her thinking to isolate the level of the problem both structurally and physiologically. For instance, this chart tries to demonstrate such thinking. Significant cardiac disorders are seen on the left. Each of the clue signs, cardiac dysfunction, left atrial enlargement, ultrasonic lung comets, effusions, and subcostal IVC findings can be seen with each sign's presence or absence noted in this table by a dot, or if a little less specific, a plus plus slash minus combination. A full explanation of this chart can be uh, more easily seen in the JUM reference, but one can see how the many diagnoses and their severities can be categorized by the presence or absence of these clue findings. So let's get started. I want to start very easy with simple orientation issues and we're going to uh, use one dollop of gel placed on the patient um, and then we'll paint from it. Put away the gel or we'll lose it. Hold the probe with one grip as shown so we don't lose orientation and perform the same full exam every time so that we get good at all its components. And work efficiently so that each uh, or so that it uh, takes less than a minute. Our residents can form a clue in less than that time. This is what years of applications have taught us. The grip we've evolved is shown. The last two digits are the only fingers that touch the patient and are usually used to stabilize the probe. That's why they have gel on them. We approach all patients from the right side, just like the physical, and hold the probe with the right hand, which could be gloved, and hold the device with the left hand, as shown. In regards to whether a device is oriented according to a radiologic or cardiac standard, we simply look 
down the barrel of the probe and align the directional marker on the probe with the screen marker. Sometimes you have to flip the probe 180 degrees to make it match. Using this method, one can use any machine or any device without knowing how to delve deep into the programming of the machine. Remember, we are going to do, use one dollop of gel, one grip, do one exam over and over again. That takes one minute. So let's get started um, and start the time for our first view, the Paris Tunnel Long Axis. Men need only unbutton their shirt. Women can keep their bra on, which saves them time. There's that single dollop of gel. Then place the gel in your pocket so you don't lose it. And then get your Paris Tunnel Long Axis. That's 15 seconds. Let's give you a repeat from your point of view. You're going to take the probe with your grip, place it in ICS 2, 3, or 4, and get your parasternal long axis while aiming at the right shoulder. Here's another zoom in view of just the hand. And you can see how you can interrogate up against that uh, parasternal region, aiming toward the right shoulder in ICS 2, 3, 4, or even 5. The more, in general, the more cephalad you uh, have your view, the better. Note that the proper plaques view is horizontally oriented. The apex is to the left. The mitral valve is in the center. The um, aortic valve and some of the ascending aorta is seen on the right. One might not see the LV apex but should align the aortic, mitral, and LV cavity in order to get the proper plane. Always the LA and RV are seen in these positions. Okay, so the, the, the first common error is that the probe is too lateral. And this is a um, endless loop here showing you the difference between the mistake of getting the probe too far laterally or to the right and letting it drift to an apical or semi-apical view. You do not want to have the apex pointing upward. As you move more laterally, the mitral valve moves into the center of the screen and the plaques becomes more horizontal. It only takes a little sliding to improve this image Error number two is a rotational error. It's easy to be off axis. Um, and, and what you're seeing in this video is the rotation from the right shoulder where it should be and off axis towards the, the uh, neck. Nine out of 10 times, you want that the plane of the beam aim toward the right shoulder, which will cut the LV and long axis. The first thing you want to do is to locate the aortic and mitral valves and then rotate to get the LV and long axis. Error number three is a tilt error. Many times when you're looking for the heart, you will be confused at obtaining not the aortic and mitral valves, but that valve, the tricuspid valve. And that's because you've tilted too far toward the right heart. You must lay the probe back down to aim at the LV, as noted in this picture. Notice how when you tilt toward the RV, you get the tricuspid valve. And it forces you to tilt back to get the aortic and mitral valves in the same plane. So in summary, this is how we're going to get the peristonal long axis. In general, you take the highest intercostal space that you can find that shows you two valves, the aortic and mitral valve. You check to be sure you're slid up against that sternum so that you're medial. And once you get those two valves in your picture, you start to rotate to get to open up that left ventricle. So you need three things in each parasternal long axis view. You need the aortic valve, the mitral valve, and the long axis of the LV.
All right, so let's start with the clue now. The first sign in clue is to assess LV function. It's the cardiac dysfunction sign. It's when the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve does not come within one centimeter of the septum. We call it kicking the septum when it's normal. You can see that in the, the red circle on the left with a normal ejection fraction, the anterior leaflet freely moves and is able to kick the septum. In the low ejection fraction state, because the ventricle has dilated and the mitral valve cordy tether the mitral valve motion, the anterior leaflet does not have the laxity to kick up and hit the septum. And it stays greater than one centimeter away, which results in creating a subjective cardiac dysfunction sign. We, um, we, we use this sign in echocardiography all the time uh, as measured as the E-point septal separation sign. But subjectively assessing it in clue has a 70% sensitivity and a 90% specificity for ejection fractions less than 40%. Okay, working backward in clue, we then ask the question, does the left atrium feel the left ventricular filling pressure? On the left, you have a normal left atrium, and on the right, you have left atrial enlargement. The left atrial enlargement sign is when the left atrium looks larger than the aorta throughout the cardiac cycle. And by larger, left atrial enlargement is important, as seen by the study in uh, 52,000 echo referrals, the left atrial systolic diameter actually predicts 10-year survival. The um, left atrial enlargement sign has a 75% sensitivity, 70% specificity for left atrial enlargement as measured in systole by um, echocardiography. So let's test what we know. Uh, we've, we've learned um, the cardiac dysfunction sign and the left atrial enlargement sign. So on the first case on the upper left, what do you think is present? So this one's pretty obvious. The cardiac dysfunction sign is present. LV, LV dysfunction is present. And the left atrium does feel this as it is enlarged much larger than the diameter of the aorta. Case number two, how about this one? This one, the left ventricular uh, function is normal as the anterior leaflet is seen to almost hit the septum a couple times. However, the left atrium is big and this generates the differential of diastolic dysfunction, atrial fibrillation, significant mitral regurgitation as possible causes. For you advanced readers, I would worry a little bit about the aortic valve, which looks stenotic, which might be causing um, uh, diastolic dysfunction. In the bottom left, Take a look at this case, what do you think? So this case shows normal LV function and normal left atrial size, but it is a good example of how the left atrium can get big in systole and almost challenge that left atrial enlargement sign. The key is left atrial enlargement sign is present only when the atrium is larger than the aorta, even in diastole or throughout the cardiac cycle. This final one is a dramatic case where the left atrium is quite small um, in, the, in the setting of a normal left ventricular ejection fraction. <clears throat> so what are the pitfalls of LV assessment using the cardiac dysfunction sign? Um, I use the mnemonic AI to remember aortic insufficiency as well as acute ischemia. Here's a case of aortic insufficiency where the jet is aimed posteriorly and because of that it directs itself up against the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve and by doing that it prevents the mitral valve from opening completely causing a large E-point septal separation sign and suggesting LV dysfunction. Now, it just turns out this ventricle is slightly dysfunctional, but uh, not as much as would be suggested by this large E-point septal separation sign. But much more common than posteriorly directed aortic insufficiency is this scenario where there is acute ischemia in the LAD dis distribution or Takasubo <clears throat> or sympathetic cardiomyopathy causing the apex to be hypokinetic or akinetic and the base to be hyperdynamic. In this scenario, the left ventricle hasn't had a chance to dilate and because of that, does not develop a large E-point septal separation sign. So in this case, as you can see, EF is going to be read, or I'm sorry, the cardiac dysfunction sign is absent as is less left atrial enlargement, but clearly there is some uh, decrease in left atrial uh, a decrease in left ventricular uh, ejection fraction. What are the pitfalls of left atrial assessment? 
Well, one is is a little esoteric, but but actually uh, quite common that we've noticed, and it's caused by a far field artifact. If you look at these two peristernal long axis views on the right, the left atrium appears to be bisected by this ghost border, which is actually the right atrial pericardial border that's being um, projected into the peristernal long axis plane because it's so bright. This is called a side lobe artifact. Uh, and if you were to think that was the uh, actual left atrial border, which is now seen with this white arrow, one would misinterpret this image to suggest that the left atrium is actually uh, smaller than it is. The upper diagram and the lower diagram both suggest that there is left atrial enlargement, and um, one has to learn to recognize this artifact so they're not fooled. Uh, I, I show another image here on the uh, left here of the right atrial right ventricle view with a tricuspid valve and the bright border seen corresponding to the border um, that you notice on the lower right projected as a ghost border into the peristernal long axis view. The other thing that happens with the left atrium as they enlarge, if there's limited space in the chest cavity, they elongate. And we've seen this happen. Um, in the upper left, you can see if this is the chest cavity, the uh, three items, the three chambers that compete for size in the AP diameter of the chest include the right ventricle up above, the aortic root, and then finally the left atrium. While the left atrium is under venous pressure, and if either of those two other chambers enlarge, the, um, the uh, left atrium can't, and it's forced in some cases to elongate, as you see in this ascending aortic aneurysm. In cases where the chest wall is uh, in AP diameter smaller, as in ankylosing spondylitis or perhaps in pectus excavatum, you can see how small that left atrium has become, uh, nearly nearly squashed as a, sink, as a, as a disc. Uh, in a more common scenario, when the right ventricle gets severely enlarged, in cases of severe pulmonary hypertension, um, the uh, left atrium can be also compressed in the AP diameter, as you see in the bottom right. Having said that, what is the pearls of, of looking at the uh, left ventricle and left atrium in combination? Well, here's a great example of someone with LV dysfunction, as you can clearly see. But if this patient comes in dyspneic, I, uh, or we don't think that it would be related to the LV dysfunction. Why? Because the left atrium is small. And that's a great clue to help determine what the causes of dyspnea are. Here's another two cases. Both of these cases demonstrate um, LV dysfunction. The cardiac dysfunction sign is present. However, the case on the left is asymptomatic while the case on the right has symptoms. And you can denote this because of the left atrial enlargement sign being present. Now, LV dysfunction, even if the patient is asymptomatic, is worthy of diagnosis. So you have to still look at the left ventricular function, even though the left atrium and the left atrial size may tell you about the symptoms of the patient. In the asymptomatic patient, NYHA class 1, you can have cardiac dysfunction. In the class 2 patient, the left atrium starts getting big, but we've noted that in exacerbated states or acutely decompensated heart failure, you usually have effusions, dilated IVC, and in uh, the severe uh, state, you have comets being present as well. The left atrial enlargement is a sign that reflects diastolic enlargement, and it's valuable in the sense that it's not reported by echocardiography. Dilatation of the left atrium in diastole is a sign of elevated LV and diastolic pressure, and is probably a better indicator of heart failure. Accordingly, left atrial enlargement is we believe, likely related to outcome risk. For instance, in the CHAD score, which is a risk for stroke and atrial fibrillation, CHF, hypertension, age, and diabetes all related to elevated LVDP, which can cause left atrial enlargement. In um, cardiac risk pre-op evaluation, again, heart failure, stroke, renal failure, CAD, and diabetes, again, all related to left atrial enlargement. 
All right, let's move on and take a look at whether the lungs feel the left atrial pressures. Again, working backward. So we're going to go from our peristernal long axis view here and look at the apices of the lung to see whether or not we see three B lines or what we have called a comet tail artifact occur. This is very quick. We do both sides to compare um, and it takes now 22 seconds total to get us through the peristernal long axis view and the two apical views of the lung. These views of the lung are taken in the mid-clavicular line in ICS 2 or 3 with gentle tilting of the um, transducer and rocking of the probe to uh, interrogate the pleural line. Do the lungs feel the left atrial pressure? So if the left atrial pressure has uh, risen to a point that the lymphatics of the lung can no longer drain, then pulmonary edema occurs. So here's the normal lung artifact, reverberation artifact, off the pleural line seen on the left. However, a different type of reverberation artifact occurs when the beam can enter a thickened uh, pleural structure uh, where we get these B lines going down across the screen uh, to the bottom of the screen. And more than three B lines we call a comet tail artifact. And so the comet sign or the ultrasonic lung comet tail sign involves three linear artifacts in the lung apex and is relatively specific in this position for interstitial edema or fibrosis. I want to show you uh, live what this um, beeline comet tail artifact looks like using a pocket-sized device uh, in its cardiac or its lung protocol. And what I think I notice here is that there isn't much of a difference between the uh, cardiac protocol and the lung protocol other than the lung protocol changes your orientation. Because we want to do clue in one exam, one protocol, one dollop of gel, one grip, and in one minute, we don't change the protocols or the probes during this uh, examination. If one looks at the uh, another uh, pocket-sized device, again, maybe a little bit better uh, distinction in the, the uh, each beeline. However, it's clearly present and easily detected uh, using the cardiac protocol. What we've also noticed is that in borderline cases, to really look at the lung at end expiration, where the comet tail artifacts seem to be more easily detected in a um, probably in a smaller lung volume. So what about where we place our probes in clue? Well, um, this study by uh, Vicky Noble's group uh, divided the um, lung into its standard eight uh, quadrants, four on each side. The uh, clue exam had been uh, devised uh, to use what they have called a zone one and zone four on both sides of the lung. And when one looks at the zones one and five, as well as zones four and eight, which represent bilateral sensitivity and specificity of doing both lungs, one gets sensitivities of 40 to 50 percent and specificities of 90 percent for CHF. What's our big confounder here? Our big confounder is probably the existence of pre existing apical interstitial lung disease. Um, in these studies of uh, patients who have smoked or who have uh, COPD, 1 in 12 or uh, even a 2% uh, can have significant lung disease caught on uh, CT scanning. These most likely cause baseline comets, which will confound you to think that there is uh, interstitial edema when the patient has these comet tail artifacts as a chronic finding. So now we're going to talk about the bases of the lung because the lung will weep fluid once it has had high pressures over time. So the presence of pleural effusions raises our sensitivity for acute decompensated CHF and represents a syndrome that has occurred over days to weeks as opposed to flash pulmonary edema which can cause comets without effusions. So 
remembering that NYHA class 3 patients, patients who have orthopnea and dyspnea on exertion, may not have comets on presentation, but um, usually have pleural effusions, as you'll see. So how do we do this? We, well, we take a little bit of gel from that original dollop of gel, and we look with knuckles to the bed posteriorly and search for pleural effusions in the bases of the supine patient, where it tends to accumulate. Now, in both these cases, you're going to see um, I'm going to use the dollop of gel and get into the uh, costophrenic angle and then drop down slightly to also see the kidney. We compare side to side the diaphragmatic level so we can have a um, comparison between two sides. Now one could alternatively do one lung all at once and then do the other lung all at once. This is also acceptable. But by the time this is done, both lungs are done, you've spent 45 seconds looking at these uh, views of the lung. So what do you look at when you, when you get these proper views? Well, one, the orientation is different. It's in a cardiologic uh, orientation where the feet are to the left and the head is to the right. This is due to the way we've gripped the probe as well as to the setup of the device. When you're set up like this with the head to the right and the feet to the left, the diaphragm looks like a backward C. As you can see here in this diagram, uh, in this video, of a pleural effusion with atelectatic lung floating in fluid. You can see in the far field the spine. On the left of the screen, one can see the spleen covered with diaphragm, a small amount of black fluid, and then a lactatic lung floating within this fluid. What's neat about the lung in this scenario is sometimes one can see, as in this case, air bronchograms, these really bright stripes that move with respiration showing that the lung is um, has patency to its larger airways. This is this air bronchogram sign has been used to make the argument that an infiltrate has occurred more so than um, absorptive atelectasis. However, uh, compressive atelectasis could still be occurring. And then finally, when you look in this view and you see this, uh, one is very concerned that the patient has an empyema or at least um, an exudative, rapidly developing uh, paranormonic effusion. But in regards to CHF, in this study of 60 patients um, admitted with CHF exacerbation, the incidence of pleural fusions by ultrasound was 91%. And pleural fusions by ultrasound were better than physical exam or chest x-ray in, in identifying patients with CHF exacerbation. So although the comets are present or have a sensitivity of only 40%, you can get to 90% diagnosis of CHF by looking for pleural fusions, particularly bilaterally. Here they have the sensitivity and specificity and predictive accuracy of pleural fusion of greater than 90% for CHF exacerbation. Well, what are the limitations of, of uh, finding this small effusion? Well, one is you have to get your fingertips or knuckles very posteriorly to the bed uh, in order to catch that posterior effusion. For instance, in the red arrow above, one would miss that small effusion, where with the green arrow, one would, would, de one would detect it. And um, the uh, very small effusion can be seen to collect in the um, paravertebral gutter, as you can see here uh, on the CT on the right with the red arrow and its corresponding um, ultrasound image. Uh, this small little effusion is not an artifact because you can see through the effusion and see the true spine in the far field. So the small pocket of fluid, although not tappable, is more useful 
as a diagnosis of it uh, of CHF when it's present in the in the in the uh, um, appropriate situation. So here is uh, what we like to do as a physical mnemonic to be sure we're posteriorly located. We ask the question: Is there fluid, and can they pee it out? Because if you can image the, the kidney in the same view while you're looking at the uh, looking for pleural fluid, you are guaranteed to be at least somewhat posterior because you're imaging a retroperitoneal organ, as well as being on plane and not too um, angled upward or ang angled downward. So we ask the question of the residents, is there fluid in the pleural cavity and can they pee it out? And when they look at the kidney, they are looking solely for uh, hydronephrosis or some gross abnormality that would suggest to them that there's some post-obstructive or problem with that kidney where they wouldn't be able to uh, diurese. Here's a case where there's a pleural fluid and we drop down, a pleural effusion and we drop down and we see the kidney using a pocket-sized device. Pitfalls to pleural effusions, here are some lookalikes. Here is ascites on the left and, um, and uh, stomach <clears throat> on the right. This turns out to be uh, on the right a, a brisk GI bleed and blood in the stomach. Notice that on the ascites on the left that the spleen here uh, we call it a naked spleen because you do not see overlying diaphragm on top of that spleen. In fact there's a little bit of fluid between the spleen and, uh, and um, lung on the right as well as diaphragm on the right. All right, so now we've gotten through the lung and we are 45 seconds into this one minute exam and we're gonna finish up with the subcostal views where we lay the probe down to get the four chamber view standard in fast and then we stand it up to look at the inferior vena cava for central venous pressures. And now we've reached the one minute mark. So let's see that again. We lay the probe down and the reason why we don't change grips here is this allows us to maintain standard orientation to the subcostal view. And then as we stand it up, we can look at the inferior vena cava as well. The subcostal view is, is actually secondary information. It's our backup view that we use, especially if we do not have a um, parasternal uh, long axis view. Now, um, we also use this uh, midline view and trace down to the aorta uh, to rule out AAA uh, since we must differentiate the IVC from the aorta in this view anyway. So one pearl is that not everyone has a good subcostal view. So if you don't get a good subcostal view, just move along. You already have a peristone long axis view. But some of the tricks to get a better subcostal view would be to move um, towards the patient's right slightly and aim back at that heart. Stay shallow as you can see me working the probe underneath his rib cage here um, and have the patient take a deep breath. If you have the patient take a deep breath, the heart will move uh, south and hopefully get closer to your, your probe. Going back to Clue, we're working backwards now. We've seen the LV, the LA, and the lungs, and now we're going to ask the question, does the right ventricle feel that pulmonary artery pressure? Uh, the normal RV is seen on the left, and the RV enlargement is seen on the right. So RV enlargement is defined when the RV is larger than the LV. The normal RV is about two-thirds the size of the LV. So if it becomes larger than the LV, um, we have fairly good specificity that... Um, uh, RV enlargement is present. Now, you've heard a lot about McConnell's sign with RV enlargement, and a McConnell's sign is a sign that's described in um, acute core pulmonale, usually from um, or described in uh, submassive or massive pulmonary embolism. And the McConnell sign is the apical tethering sign where the, um, or I'm sorry, the apical hinge point sign where the um, there's a hinge point in the apices of all three, uh, particularly best seen on, uh, on the one on the right, 
where the apex of the RV is hyperdynamic and follows the left ventricular function, which is hyperdynamic, but the rest of the RV is dilated and uh, poorly contractile with poor tricuspid valve motion. And because of this, there appears to be a hinge point up in the RV apex. That's McConnell's sign. But it's not always submassive pulmonary embolism. For instance, in this case on the left, where there's clearly a McConnell sign, there's a right ventricular myocardial infarction as the cause. On the middle frame, this is a patient who has chronic core pulmonality and their RV is enlarged, but has developed sepsis and a hyperdynamic left ventricle. Um, and then finally, on the right is a case of acute core pulmonality due to ARDS. Uh, in all three of these cases, um, these are uh, lookalikes to a scenario of a submassive pulmonary embolism and um, gives us pause before rushing and giving TPA in this scenario. Then finally, does the IVC feel the right ventricular pressure? The normal IVC is seen on the left where we expect it to um, show 50% respiratory variation with breathing and the elevated scenario with elevated CVP is seen with a plethoric IVC approximating the size of the neighboring aorta um, and that doesn't uh, show respiratory variation. The sensitivity and specificity for this sign is 85% and 80% for elevation in central venous pressures by catheterization. Here they are live showing you the difference uh, in respiratory dynamics with the inspiration. Probably the most important thing to do when one looks at the IVC is to find the aorta and to differentiate the two. So we've seen cases where the patient is hypotensive and so dehydrated that the IVC is what we call the sliver in the liver. So beware the sliver in the liver because if you miss that and look and misidentify the one vessel that you do see, which is the aorta, and suspect it's the IVC, then um, severe errors can occur in hypotension, in the diagnosis of pericardial tamponade, um, in assessment of, of what to do with IV fluids. So remember, the IVC can be, and beware the sliver in the liver, is on the right of the spine, has thin, non-parallel walls usually, can collapse with respiration, and the branches are the hepatic veins. If you want to make the IVC bigger, do a straight leg raise and give yourself uh, or give the patient some um, self-transfused volume. That should make the IVC at least visible. And the setting of the, uh, or in the aorta on the other hand, is deep to the liver, as you can see in this diagram. Um, it's on the left of the spine. It has thick parallel walls, sometimes with atheromatous disease, which is usually seen in the abdominal portion of the aorta, not the um, upper thoracic uh, by its surface ultrasound. And um, it doesn't collapse, and its branches feed the bowel. Here's an um, anatomic diagram showing the difference between tilting between the IVC and the aorta, and why the aorta is apparently below the liver as opposed to within the liver. Now here are some pitfalls or some um, curiosities, I should say, in regards to the way the um, IVC behaves. So first is, let me show you two cases and ask you a simple question. This is the same inspiratory volume. Which patient has the higher IVC, a uh, higher uh, CVP? One would guess the one on the left, right? Because with breathing the same inspiratory volume, the one on the left, the IVC does not show much variation. However, let me just say that these are the same patient. These images come from the same patient. And the one on the left is breathing with his chest wall. And the one on the right is breathing primarily with his diaphragm. And you can get a sense of that with the motion of the um, image on the diaphragmatic breath. This tells us that, or we um, concluded that when you take a breath with your diaphragm, you raise intra-abdominal pressure and you have a compressive effect on the IVC. So it's not just collapse of the IVC due to falling 
intrathoracic pressures, it's also compression of the IVC due to raising of the intra-abdominal pressures when you take a breath. So this has implications regarding patients who are obese, who have a very heavy and large liver, who have high intra-abdominal pressures due to uh, intra-abdominal fat or um, ileus, both of which may cause uh, compression or spurously flat IVCs. Conversely, in patients with COPD or CHF where their diaphragm does not descend and is dysfunctional or flattened, perhaps they have falsely plethoric IVCs suggesting that they have core pulmonale or CHF. And then finally, what's very interesting about this is that if one believes that right atrial pressure is shared by both IVC and SVC flow, then you can start to understand how Kuzmal signs and blunted or exaggerated falls cause, are caused in the JVP in patients with diaphragmatic dysfunction. The other uh, interesting thing we're noticing about the IVC is, regards uh, Guyton curves and cardiac um, output that the that they're in a steady state cardiac output and venous return are linked so let's take a look at these three this is the same patient the, his IVC in three scenarios the gentleman has a pacer in and what we're going to do in this volume replete state is we're going to change his heart rates and see what happens to his um, IVC now remember, in this volume replete state, when we increase his heart rate, his cardiac output goes up a little bit. Um, so here he is at baseline with a heart rate of 70. Now we're going to increase his heart rate by increasing his pacer. And look what happens. His, the tachycardia, the increased cardiac output, has drained, so to speak, the IVC and dropped central venous pressures. And then finally, Let's make him bradycardic to 40 beats per minute, and one can see right afterwards that the IVC is big or bigger again. Now this has lots of implications in regards to um, the SERS or septic state where tachycardia is occurring, and we see that the IVC is small and then tend to give fluid, thinking the patient is hypovolemic. We have to now admit that some of that um, IVC sign is occurring because the, or I'm sorry, it's not the IVC sign, some of that IVC depletion is occurring because the cardiac output has increased. And you can see that if, if you travel up along this Guyton curve, that as cardiac output goes up, um, the pressure in the central venous compartment falls. And if one replaces cardiac output with heart rate, and central venous pressure with IVC, one can see uh, a, a similar um, phenomenon happening with the IVC diameter falling when the heart rate increases. Here's the extreme scenario in a patient who has uh, coded and passed away where his heart rate is zero. So when his heart rate is zero, one would wonder what would his IVC look like? Well, his IVC is dilated as there's nothing to offload this uh, venous return. Okay, to finish up, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the clue now. In summary, the clue includes one through four uh, and a little bit of five in this diagram so you, uh, of, of physical examination at the bedside using ultrasound. That's one through five uses the cardiac probe, where if you have a linear probe where you can look at the vascular structures, we proceed and expand clue to include the carotid for subclinical atherosclerosis um, and risk stratification, uh, the JVP to confirm IVC. We do uh, femoral compression uh, for DVT as well as assess atherosclerosis in the femoral artery bifurcation, uh, as well as um, the popliteal fossa. We look for compressibility of the popliteal vein. But as one gets better, one can imagine that clue can continue to expand to include um, more advanced cardiac Doppler and apical views, as well as um, more views of the chest wall using the linear probe, as well as more views of the internal organs of the abdomen, including the pancreas, the biliary system, as well as pelvic organs and prostate. 
And then ultimately, you can look uh, at uh, lymph nodes, thyroid, and perform Doppler uh, when assessing carotid lesions. Um, not to be forgotten are the uh, huge gains for the outpatient physician as well in assessing the musculoskeletal system once you have a higher frequency probe. Ultimately, this morphs into a bedside ultrasonic physical examination. Now, since we're running short on time, what I'd like to do is go through a case very briefly of a 24-year-old hospitalized male with respiratory failure followed by a PEA arrest. So as you clue this patient, the first thing you get is your peristernal lung axis. And what do you see? You see here a hyperdynamic left ventricle and a small left atrium. So right away you know that it's very unlikely that this patient has uh, cardiac dyspnea as the cause of his respiratory failure. Next, you move on up to the apices of the lung and bilateral, very uh, closely packed cometal artifacts are seen. If you look at the bases, again checking for congestive heart failure, there is, there is no pleural. There are no pleural effusions. So you have pulmonary edema, which appears acute and possibly non-cardiac in etiology. When one looks at the subcostal views, one gets RV enlargement and the McConnell sign, as well as dilatation of the inferior vena cava. So what do we have here? We have a scenario of ultrasonic comet tail artifacts being present with IVC dilatation. If we go back and uh, look at his chest x-ray, we get the same findings of a diffuse interstitial pattern seen, as well as a little bit of cardiomegaly. Going to our chart that we looked at initially, when we look at who has um, ultrasonic comets and uh, an increased uh, inferior vena cava diameter, in the differential is included ARDS with non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, as well as below that COPD with core pulmonale, um, as well as submassive pulmonary embolism. Well, this case ends up being one where he has acute respiratory distress syndrome with core pulmonale. The reason why um, pulmonary emboli seemed a little bit less likely was the presence of symmetric and bilateral edema in the upper lobes. The patient then suffered PEA arrest. This is what the lung exam now shows. The right lung has a reverberation artifact not and has lost its comet tail artifacts compared to the left, which again shows these very densely packed comet tail artifacts. What, what's happening here? If one takes the high frequency probe and looks, one can see that uh, despite the motion artifact, that it's very hard to show sliding in the right anterior chest. So this patient developed a pneumothorax, tension pneumothorax, in the setting of ARDS, um, resulting in a, a PEA arrest. After the chest tube was placed, this is his chest x-ray with chest tube, and it's nice to see that we can confirm the comets on the right are once again back, suggesting that the lung has been reinflated in the um, chest cavity. So this was a case of a critically ill patient in the ICU who coded, who had a significant differential that you had to work through where a bedside examination using Clue um, over time was able to narrow the diagnosis to ARDS with acute core pulmonale, which was sub subsequently complicated by a pneumothorax. So in summary, we've talked about how Clue is a collection of quick look signs that are either present or absent and are evidence-based. That Clue is a ultrasonic physical where you get formative data to create a differential diagnosis, and that with Clue, you have one transducer, one cardiac precept, one dollop of gel, and you perform the one exam in one minute.
although it is expandable. You've learned to work backward against the flow of blood. You've learned the clues mnemonic to remember the um, differential diagnosis as well as the imaging order. You've learned to hold the probe with one grip and the reasoning behind that and orientation of uh, images as a result of this. And then finally, you've learned how to complete this exam uh, within a minute. A case has been shown where you've used, used the data uh, from Clue to make a life-saving diagnosis. So I hope this one hour has been well spent, uh, allowing you to understand at least our uh, experience with cardiac point of care ultrasound through the Clue exam. And it's been a pleasure. Um, I, if you have any questions, uh, go, feel free to enter them now. If not, you can reach me for any questions you have regarding Clue um, at humura.bruce at scriptshealth.org. That's again, humura.bruce at scriptshealth, one word, dot org. Thanks so much, Dr. Kamura, for this um, wonderful presentation. And behalf, on behalf of the AIUM, the ACP, and SUSME, our thanks to all of you who participated tonight. Everyone, please remember to complete the post-test and the activity evaluation. We hope you enjoyed this presentation, and will join us again for future webinars. Good night, everyone.